let's move to the first session of uh, uh, today's um, event. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, His Excellency Enrita for the inspiring talk, and I will take the challenge that Mr. Ambassador just launched myself. Next time I come to Beijing, and I will visit you. Um, allow me to call on stage uh, uh, the moderator of the next session, which, which is titled Financial Systems at the Crossroad, Open Challenges in Europe and China. So the moderator is going to be Stefano Caselli, Dean for International Affairs, Bocconi University. Then uh, Federico Bazzoni, Managing Director of uh, uh, head, head of Coverage uh, Cross-Border China uh, EMEA, um, Investment Corporate Finance, sorry. James Lee, uh, Chairman and CEO of uh, EJ McKay, and Eugenio Morpurgo, CEO of Fineuro Soditic uh, Group. Okay, that's great. It's a great pleasure to, to stay here and uh, uh, basically we have to start the journey. So we have to start crossing to uh, the Silk Road and what we decided to do is to, to start the journey using the angle of, of finance and finance potentially could be something relevant to enhance connectivity as it's written on, on the slide and discussing together with, with our guest last night uh, our idea is that finance could be quite relevant to generate synergies, dialogue, cooperation opportunities. And what we see is that there are a lot of opportunities on the both sides in Europe and, and, and in Asia. Before starting my job to uh, moderate the, the session, I would like to uh, start breaking the ice and to put on the table what are the main challenges we see uh, both in Europe and in Asia, talking about our job, which is finance. Uh, the idea is to focus on three different areas that are quite relevant today. The first one is related to M&A, and we will be discussing a lot about M&A, which is really the menu of the catch of the day when we talk about finance. The second topic is related to the banking sector, and banking sector is really under a storm in Europe and is moving very fast in uh, uh, China. And the last topic is related to business education, which basically is the backbone of, of everything. And definitely, if you want to have a very solid financial system, we dramatically need education behind it. Just a couple of words related to uh, the three areas. When we talk about uh, M&A, M&A is uh, honestly uh, something where we can see uh, that the Silk Road is very crowded today, because if we use the keywords of M&A that basically are the upside and the leverage. We see a lot of ideas and opportunities to generate synergies between Europe and China. If we talk about upside in Europe, there are tons in a certain sense of trophy assets. There are tons of unexploited assets that couldn't receive a lot of value. But on the other way around, uh, China could represent really something relevant to generate more values to increase sales for European companies that want to grasp growth in other areas. And we talk about leverage, which is definitely the fuel to enhance M&A process. Mm -hmm. Leverage is quite abundant today in China, but also on the other side of the table, in Europe, liquidity is uh, very relevant, and companies can use in the right way liquidity to enhance the process of acquisition. If you talk about banking, banking sector today is quite interesting in uh, in China, and something very relevant is happening because if you talk about the Chinese banking system, first of all, there was a big change related to the introduction of the deposit insurance system that, in my opinion, is quite relevant to help, in a certain sense, the retail market to uh, switch from the usage of the stock exchange and to consolidate, in a certain sense, the process of wealth creation within the banking system. The second one is the liberalization of interest rate that was very relevant to generate competition within the Chinese banking system. The third one is the introduction of Basel III that in a certain sense was introduced probably in a much wiser way than, than Europe, in a more progressive way, and is contributing a lot to consolidate in a certain sense the system. And the last challenge get, would be relevant also for the next session, which is related to Innovation. It's very interesting that 
the, sh the concept of shadow banking is becoming a concept of banking in China because many players belonging to uh, e-commerce are entering into the banking arena, creating new banks that are competing in an incredible way within the banking system. And they could represent, in a certain sense, an example, a good proxy also for what is going to happen in, uh, in Europe. And the last aspect is related to uh, education. Why education? Education is the backbone of everything. So in a certain sense, if you want to create a very solid, a very effective uh, financial system, we dramatically need education. And if we consider the, the Chinese system, we have only good news. Coming to rankings that were mentioned by our rector, Andrea Sironi, I want just simply to highlight two aspects that I consider very relevant. The ranking of Financial Times and QS. 20 years ago, considering the first 50 position, we didn't have tea, we didn't find any Chinese business school. Today, nine Chinese business school within the first nine. If I consider QS ranking 20 years ago, only one Chinese university, 11 Chinese university today. That means uh, uh, considering the two options uh, to make or to buy talent, it's very clear that the Chinese market is voting for to make talent. And that makes sense to announce in a certain sense the backbone of the financial system. But I would like to stop. That, that was fine to, to break the ice. I would like to uh, introduce our three incredible uh, panelists, uh, Federico Bazzoni, Managing Director of CITIC, so very involved within the capital market and the M&A uh, between uh, Europe and uh, uh, China. Mr. James Lee, uh, Chairman and CEO, or EGA Mackey, so very hands-on within the M&A process and Eugenio Morpurgo, CEO of Finerop Soditic, and again, a very relevant key player for the M&A process. I would like to start with, with Federico. Uh, the first question is related to a very relevant <laughs> issue. Uh, why the Chinese are now becoming a serious candidate on the M&A arena? What is your opinion about that, Federico? Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation, and thank you, I love to be here. Um, uh, I am the first example, without making any advertisement about what I'm doing, of the cross-border right. uh, business. I, I've been working for many years of, with the um, international bank. Now I'm working for a Chinese bank for six years with Citic, which is one of the largest SOE bank. So I need to be a little bit careful what I'm saying because I'm a, a state-owned bank. I am a civil servant uh, in, in one way, but, but at the same time, I'm also on, on the business side. Uh, the question is very relevant. Um, because the transition of the Chinese investment in the last couple of years has been dramatic. Um, we had before, as I said, in my career, been doing Asia for 32 years. Uh, I'm doing M&A for almost my life. Um, the Chinese attitude has changed dramatically in the last uh, 18 months. Uh, we now see the Chinese player becoming more aggressive in a way but also more knowledgeable. We wasted a lot of time uh, in, in the year before. We had a lot of, uh, uh, in a way, uh, weak uh, attitude from, uh, from the Chinese SOE or the Chinese company, uh, not going well prepared to the M&A activity. We are now seeing some strong players coming to the market. They understand quite well uh, what they want to buy. Uh, they are quite focused on, uh, on, on, on the target, not only uh, Europe, I'm talking about globally. Um, we still have a lot of, and uh, we'll talk later probably about the cultural gap between uh, right. uh, China and the rest of the world, or, excuse me, the other way around. I've uh, been uh, representing a few <coughs> company, European companies selling uh, uh, to, 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 to Chinese, I've uh, been uh, advising uh, European company, Italian company. Uh, by coincidence, I'm Italian, but I'm happy to be Italian. So uh, our markets become extremely valuable now for Chinese uh, uh, buyers. Uh, sometimes the culture is also on the other side. We have uh, European company, Italian company, they don't make any effort. I'm sorry to be very brutal, but they don't, <laughs> they don't make any effort to understand the Chinese culture. So we have a situation where Chinese are very well prepared to come and buy the asset. And on the other side, we have uh, the seller who is not prepared at all, or, or they, in a way, discriminate still the Chinese attitude. 
It's very, very frequently we still have um, an attitude towards the Chinese uh, investment who is quite uh, resistant. I prefer as a seller to go to an American buyer because Chinese, they will uh, uh, waste time. There will be very slow decision. So therefore, me, same price, I go for an American U European buyers. And that's becoming still, still a problem. It's not because it was still a, an issue for a lot of transaction. Um, I, I think, in a way, is an ongoing process. We have a lot of uh, um, probably suggestion uh, to, to make. We are advisor, so my, our job is to advise, to advise company. And uh, also with my colleagues here, probably we can share the same view. Uh, the Chinese, again, they were very much against until a few, few, few months ago to pay fees to advisor. They were going themselves to try to buy company. Finally, they realized they need an advisor, they need an investment banker, they need to, to pay some legal fees. I'm not saying something, uh, again, uh, too aggressive, but this is the reality. Uh, the, probably 24 months ago, uh, you, you're going to make a pitch to a SOE company, state-owned enterprise company in China, and they will say, no, no, I'm not paying any fees. You just, you need to be proud to serve me. <laughs> and then we go together to make a bid, and if successful, we'll see what we can pay. Of course, I mean, as an investment banker, there's no way you can provide service, you can provide assistance. Now they are coming down in a very good pragmatic approach. How much can you pay you? Oh, let's negotiate the fees. You help us, you give us assistance, and we are, uh, in a way, more effective. So the, the changing is dramatic in the last few months. We'll see the Chinese buyers extremely well prepared. So the Silk Road seems to be toll-free for advisors. So it, it, well, we were very, very, we're very busy, I have to say. That it's, okay, it's quite busy, busy time and, and uh, probably successful time for the time being. But it's no, going to continue. You. Thank you, Federico. And uh, James, uh, uh, seeing the story from your perspective, uh, as the Silk Road seems to be very crowded, even if toll-free, uh, but what is your idea, what are the challenges you see considering uh, China, Italy m and transactions, which are very popular today? Well, just to build on what Federico said, uh, there are many challenges, but the top three that comes to my mind first is that um, people only come to us with leftovers. That is... Uh, you know, when there's a good deal, then it's absorbed locally. And then there's a deal that nobody wants. Deeply troubled deals, they come to us. Although there's a sucker born every day, but I don't like to be a sucker. So that is the first challenge. That is deeply troubled companies, not necessarily Italy, but in Europe, when they can't find a buyer, when they're going bankrupt, they <laughs> when cannot find further financing, either it's Italian, German, American, they'll think, oh, let's go to the Chinese. Okay, so first thing, but you know, <coughs> these deals are very difficult to close. Uh, um, I have in the process, uh, let's, take, let's not talk about Italy, but in the process of doing such deals, uh, I have one sell side client, you know, halfway through the deal, they went bankrupt. So we can't even sell them. Okay, so this is something, I mean, gradually they're shifting, but, but um, it does represent a challenge. That is, if you try to sell something that is not sellable, then you won't make it. So that's the first thing. Um, and second is there are good deals in anywhere in the world, and they are usually absorbed, digested, before um, we really get, get our arms around it. In other words, um, we, when we hear about a good opportunity, they are usually halfway through and gone. So for example, uh, last night I uh, placed a call to Europe for a pretty interesting opportunity that we have clients interested in paying a good price. And this morning I heard back that they are very close to go inclusive. <laughs> and therefore, you know, a very nice way to say this is that if something goes wrong, they will come to us. But if something goes wrong, then they probably, it's gonna go wrong with us also. So I have two, these two things. One is that, you know, bad deals come to us, and good deals we cannot get hold of, then what's out there for us? Then maybe just buying a real estate. <laughs> okay, so these are the two things when we see, um, on the uh, the side, I mean, from China to Europe, and the third thing that you look at the the Chinese uh, companies, actually, uh, Federico being kind, actually, a lot of Chinese companies, most of them are not really sophisticated or prepared enough. So they say, okay, sure, we should own something in Europe, in Italy, and you know, broadly speaking, that's fine. But then when it comes to the specifics, then they get lost. They they're gonna say, oh, so what do we do with this company? 
And that's a big question, right? That's a big question. Anyone can come in and just uh, offer some perspective. Maybe what do we do with the company? The answer is that you need to find the right CEO. And there's a people question. Because I had once talking with a pretty big company, and he goes, yeah, you know, we're in the textile business. And it actually makes sense for us to own something in Italy, but what do I do with it after I own it? Because nobody in my company can manage it. So that's probably a question that uh, Bocconi can answer, find some CEOs for them. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and, and some other questions such as, um, uh, the, you know, the broadly speaking, what do we do with the tax? Um, I think Eugenio advised on a tax situation for a major Chinese acquisition, or what do we do with the general operation or strategy? Maybe uh, consultants, et cetera, can have a role in this. But in general, is that large companies in China are not yet uh, <coughs> uh, professionally run, and they very much manage based on uh, their in business intuitions. And business intuition work very well within your cultural and also uh, you know, trained context. But once you're lifted out of your comfort zone, then all of these intuitions are gone, and that's the time the buyers get lost. And that also results in much slower uh, and complicated uh, uh, interaction with the Chinese. Therefore, I think a lot of sellers they find that, uh, oh, you're so much trouble negotiating with you. You can ask all these questions that are not customary, then why do I bother? So, I mean, coming back is that we want to do, you know, we want to get our arms around good deals, but they usually don't come to us. So that's one challenge. But I think from the other side of the mirror is that the buyers usually also have some issues and then making them the less attractive buyers. So, yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, uh, Eugenio, you, you really <laughs> love numbers, so I think it's the right time to talk about uh, numbers. Uh, what is, in your opinion, the, the, the state of the art of FDIs between Italy, Italy and China? I think uh, that we can talk about volume, industries, so exactly what we do in investment banking course. So. So first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and for being here. Yeah, when we speak about uh, M&A between uh, China and Italy, I mean, the numbers are really astonishing because the Silk Road uh, is becoming one-way road. So we see a lot of investments uh, of Chinese companies into Italy, and uh, over the last year, the numbers of Italian acquisition into China has just been ridiculous. So, and this gap is becoming uh, larger and larger. In particular, what is remarkable is that the initiatives of Italian firms in China have slowed down uh, since the inception of the financial crisis in 2008 and 2011. While uh, since then, the volume of Chinese investments into Italy have increased uh, dramatically. Uh, some of the uh, more recent acquisitions uh, of Chinese companies into Italy were mega deals. Uh, and uh, over the last uh, uh, two years, uh, we had the 30 acquisitions from Chinese companies into Italy, like uh, ChemChina Pirelli. We will have a very important guest uh, this evening. Uh, and uh, Alsando Energia was bought by uh, Shanghai Electric. The volume of the investments over the last two years was uh, 14, 14, 14 billion uh, uh, euro. Preferred industries. Preferred industries were not such trophy assets. We were talking about fashion brands. No. In this case, uh, uh, competition is very aggressive by side when we speak about trophy assets. So Chinese companies were more interested, are more interested now in uh, capital intensive business like energy and industrial components uh, in which technology and uh, capital intensive, capital expenses are involved. And recently also healthcare including uh, biomedical products and healthcare services. Uh, compared to the investors coming from the Arabic countries, uh, very low interest in real estate uh, and also in financial services, but the situation is now changing. Uh, what is important you also greenfield investments are increasing uh, in, uh, in Italy. Uh, larger Chinese corporations are opening their own branches uh, in Italy, 
And also immigration is very important. We have small size entrepreneurs which are opening a business in Italy, especially in the textile business. The impact has been very, very important. The number of Italian acquisitions into China is extremely low. Uh, two, only two small size deals in 2013 performed by Brembo and Fiera di Milano. Curiously enough, uh, uh, by far the most important investors uh, into China coming from Italy are from the Lombardia region, almost 80-90%. So there is a strong presence of company in Lombardia coming to uh, China. No acquisition at all in 2014. Incredible. No acquisition of Italian companies performed in, uh, in China. And only one in 2015. Brembo. Again, Brembo in care breaking system. Traditionally, Italian invests uh, into China in uh, automotive components. In the past, they were very active uh, in retail business um, and also household appliances. If we go back to 2009 and before, the number of acquisitions was very, very high with companies like Luxottica, Polint, Candy, Begelli, De Longhi, Ses Getters, Miroglio, investing into China. So there is a gap, the gap is increasing, and the Italian managers and entrepreneurs seem to be scared uh, of the complexity of the Chinese market uh, and now are much more oriented towards uh, United States, Germany as a place to invest. Thank you. Thank you, Genio. And uh, Federico, let's come back <coughs> to, uh, to the M&A process. So uh, the M&A process is a mix of different stories of numbers, of assets, uh, of industrial perspective and also is a mix, is a merge of, of culture. Do you think that culture is still an obstacle, is a facilitator within the M&A process between uh, Italian or European companies and Chinese companies? It is. I mean, very, very obviously it is. Uh, I think the, the, the cultural uh, background of, of, of the buyer, the seller is very important. It's played a big, a big, uh, it's got a big weight on, on the transaction. Uh, again, following on the Eugenio, uh, the good news, we have some mandates on the buy side from, from European company, two Italians, so auto component. Uh, and in this case, the cultural gap is huge because the company, well, our client in this case, they try to buy a company in China on auto component, particular segment. Uh, you're going into the culture of this Chinese company is very local Chinese, uh, no international background at all. Uh, the management coming down from, from Italy in this case is, is very Italian. And you need to help the, not only the language, but the understanding of the way to do business. There's two completely different way, uh, and James probably will agree with me, between Chinese way to conduct business and Italian, or European way to conduct business. The big mistake we find quite often is that the, the Chinese, for example, they try to get answer from uh, target from um, European company in a Chinese way. So they are asking questions on due diligence. They are relevant to China. They are irrelevant to, to, to Italy, to Europe. And that's a big first cultural gap that we see. So we need to, again, educate. Uh, we have to educate the, the buyer, in this case, either the Chinese or, or the European, and understand how the, what's the best way to do business in the, in the, in the country of, of the target. The second observation that I have on, on, the, on, the, on the pure background is that sometimes, uh, again, I don't want to be too straightforward because of, 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 my, of my job, but uh, Chinese sometimes are a little bit arrogant on the approach in the last, uh, again, few, few, few months. Uh, we had a different attitude a few years ago where the Chinese were uh, trying to buy, but very prudent. Now they are extremely uh, aggressive, they are coming down and they want to buy. They want to buy in uh, 24 days, if they can. They want to buy quite quick. Uh, we have, uh, i give you a good, a good example. On the 24th of December, I was skiing with a family in Japan and I received a call from uh, the chairman of uh, a uh, large insurance company, Chinese, who is telling me, can you organize a meeting on the 26th of December in 
I'm not telling you the, the, the country, but with the, the well, in Italy, with the charm of the large uh, financial company in Italy on the 26th of December. Early morning or uh, okay. any time? I'm, 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 I'm coming down. That's I take my, 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 my private jet. Is and, uh, in could you please try, Mr. Uh, it's difficult. It's possible. Please, you have to do it because. I need to come down and I need to meet the chairman <laughs> of the company. So you get you need to explain again, not only the, the holiday season, but how to approach a different uh, sort of profile. Uh, uh, the last comment I have is on the practical uh, execution, as right. Stefan, you ask, how to go into the final closing of a deal and how the culture gap sometimes is playing a game. Um, uh, again, you, you are the table of negotiation. Uh, we did a deal last year with public. We advised a company called Filippo Berio, Salov, is an Italian company selling, uh, uh, producing olive oil. And the buyer was a very famous uh, Shanghainese buyer, is a buy food, who is the largest probably SOE right. in, in the food business. And our client is the, in this case, was the Italian. Uh, on the closing day, they, they did a fantastic ceremony. They invite the, the the bright food company to, to Lucca, you know, the beautiful city, and to have a, a olive oil taste. And it was the day of the signing. Uh, but again, the problem was there, uh, who's going to sign? The family controlling the business is the three brothers. And there was a little bit of uh, conversation of who's going to sign the, 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 the contract uh, in, in terms of internal, uh, internal discussion. The chairman of the Chinese company was very surprised because he was coming down just to put the stamp okay. on, the, on, the, on the deal and with the money already pretty much wired through the bank. And we lost, uh, again, this is, uh, it's confidential, but it pretty much, I mean, a call of the deal. We lost one day. We had to postpone the closing because we have to find out who was the signing party in, in the family. And that's quite, quite an interesting, I think, story to understand the culture uh, and, and to be able, probably, from both sides, to be prepared. Um, I, I, I think, like, once again, um, the Silk Road is open. There's a lot of deals uh, that are coming through um, Europe uh, into China and the other way around. Um, we probably need to understand more the target and to come down more prepared. That, that's my strong suggestion. Thank you, Federico. And James, being an advisor within, within the M&A process, what are the solutions you see to face the many challenges we are putting on the table? Okay. Um, one easy solution is to make sure both sides pay money. <laughs> that's very right. pragmatic. So that's very, right. Okay, let me come down to the specifics. For a deal to happen, uh, both sides, um, uh, we've seen really both sides come with not only bankers but lawyers. Um, and then meaning once you have a banker, a lawyer and other advisors, you do need to pay them. Then the likelihood of a transaction happening is much higher than one side probably being uh, brokered by a banker and the other side just comes out people to visit and to uh, meetings and to understand. So, uh, so the one very uh, pragmatic really uh, advice to everyone is that both sides come with a commitment. A commitment meaning you come with people uh, who don't come uh, for free and also who are professional. So this is, uh, uh, let's say, on the technical side. And if you take a step back, is that you know we see the problem of uh, being not able to uh, really access um, attractive opportunities, and this is something uh, about credibility building and also about relationship building. Now, that is, you need to know each other. Uh, you need to know, you know, if you think about a company on the block, either you know on the buy side or sell side, you need to know who owns it. The management needs to be engaged, the owner needs to be engaged, and then if they have hired a banker, the banker also needs to have a relationship with you so that things can facilitate. And to that end, then you need to get in the circle on both sides. Um, that is the Chinese on the Italian side and Italians all on the Chinese side. So get to know each other. And I think you know, if you come to these two things too, is that people, uh, uh, people think that is, um, uh, for the, in a general sense, you need to know each other and trust each other. And then, but that means you have to get in a certain circles. I hope the university can play a role in getting people together so that they can build certain, um, a certain trust. Um, and the other is really when the process starts and both sides need to have people who can support it professionally. 
so it comes down to actually uh, fundamentally a people and trust issue. And trust means uh, both uh, trusting in your integrity and also trusting in your competency. Thank you, James. And let's move into uh, deal making, Eugenio. Uh, what, what are the structure of acquisitions you see today in the, in the market, especially related to the nature of the acquirer? Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you. First of all, talking about uh, the nature of the investors, uh, if we start with Chinese investments into Italy, uh, most of the Chinese buyers over the last year were corporate strategic buyers. Only a couple of private equity funds were active, uh, uh, Mandarin and United Trademark Group, uh, but they had the strong geographic or industry angles uh, or they acted jointly with the corporate buyers like Zoom Lion. Most of the acquisition, being corporate strategic buyers, were majority deals. Minorities were acquired only larger state-owned group like GDP Reti or Ansaldo Energia. There were two minority deals. Or small percentages of larger stock listed group like uh, Fiat, Telecom, Prismian, Eni, Enel, Generali. So a very important, uh, very important companies, but only with uh, 2%, 1.5%. But still, uh, the amount of investments is increasing also in this kind of more financial uh, investments. The rational uh, is uh, not really buying uh, luxury trophy assets, but rather creating a strong uh, platform in Italy and gaining additional uh, technology. So high attention is paid to the quality of the manufacturing process and also to the logistic uh, of the factory. Due to these particular angles and also to the fact that uh, in many cases uh, Chinese companies are interested in turnaround projects, uh, Competition by side is not too aggressive. So Chinese company with a good execution can have a real chance to buy Italian assets. But when it comes to trophy assets, to quality assets, <coughs> it is really very difficult because competition by private equity funds or by larger French luxury groups to talk about fashion is very, very strong. Uh, multiples are always double digits on EBITDA and uh, the kind of time it is, uh, it is devoted to the process uh, is very, very quick. So sometimes uh, Chinese firms, they do not have the time to act uh, uh, in such uh, uh, auctions, in such uh, so tight selling procedures. Italian investments in China we were saying before, are focused more on industrial components and retail uh, with much lower deal value and also more frequently under the form of uh, minority participation and joint venture. This is to reduce the amount of investment. This is to reduce overall risk. Uh, but in many cases, it, it can bring long term uh, a governance problem, as we are seeing uh, in the project that were performed uh, 10 years, 15 years ago in the Chinese market. Thank you, Eugenio. A last round before uh, leaving the microphone to our audience for some questions. Uh, Federico, again, uh, you mentioned before uh, SOEs and private Chinese investors. So, in a certain sense, the two players we have on the market. Uh, what is your feeling about the roles that COEs and private Chinese investors can play within uh, the M&A uh, process? Two different positions in two right. different attitudes. Uh, SOE, they are by definition a state-owned enterprise company. When they buy an asset, they need to buy majority because they have to consolidate the asset into the balance sheet. So therefore, the target are uh, extremely uh, limited and they are extremely slow on, on, on execution. Uh, SOE, James will uh, for sure support me on this. They are very difficult uh, animals to, to deal with. I'm an SOE as well, so I know quite <laughs> well my, my, my side. Very difficult animals. <laughs> <laughs> very bureaucratic. There's a lot of uh, challenge. The SOE management is always looking to protect personal liability. Right. If some of my colleague I will be here, I, I think I'll, I'll be grilled, but <laughs> I'll be in trouble. But the bottom line, uh, when you do a deal with SOE, 
you always have the management very protective and they try to find a way to, uh, I mean, as I say, to, to be on the defense side. And that will slow down the process. Private uh, company, they are more clear aggressive. Uh, they are going down and now they are changing attitude, they are buying also minority. Until a few months ago, also private company, they were telling us, no, no, I want majority, I want to control the company. Now, after a few mistakes, the private side, you need to remember the private in China means a family business right. who are becoming public through listing. That's pretty much the pattern of the of the uh, of, of the recent months, uh, the recent years, and these guys they are uh, less prepared than the SOE in terms of uh, structure. They're coming down with less uh, knowledge about the market. Sometimes they are very rural uh, company who have been listed just few 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 years ago. So they are not so sophisticated as, as the SOE as a sort of system. Therefore, we need to spend more time on education again. Uh, but the good news that they are. Uh, more willing to buy minority, and that give us probably more targets. Uh, also, another important definition, I can spend hours on this subject because it's pretty much the business, <laughs> but, but another important I mean, the distinction is that the, 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 the minority, uh, sorry, the, 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 private, the private sector, uh, as James was saying, they're quite willing to keep the management of the company. Now, a few years ago, again, Chinese attitude was Let's go there, put down all the Chinese management, change the CEO, and try to uh, reverse uh, the company uh, control. Now the attitude is, I want to keep the management. If I buy a target in Italy, I, you need to make sure the CEO will stay, the top line management needs to stay, and then I will be comfortable. That's a very good attitude. They're completely reversing the Japanese attitude of uh, 15 years ago, as you know, Japanese came down and kill all the, all the management. So good news for, for the target, and now they are, they are changing. Uh, just concluding on, uh, on uh, what we are seeing as, as a flow. There's a lot, as Eugene was saying, demands on, uh, uh, in terms of sector. Uh, robotic, I mean, we are eager to find any single target on robotic. They've got Chinese private SOE. They want to buy robotic or automation. Uh, there's definitely a big, a big trend on uh, healthcare. And medical device, particularly, that's where, I mean, globally, we, we are looking for, for targets in every single market, from Israel to, to, to Italy. Uh, consumer food and beverage is always an appeal for, for Chinese, but brand. They're looking for brand, they're not looking for the uh, probably uh, second line or, or, or wide brand company. Uh, and that's again, in Italy, we have some brand, but all the now the, the, the food and beverage scale is quite limited in terms of size, and we are looking for sizable uh, business. And lastly, uh, fig uh, financial and insurance, particularly insurance, the super mega trend in China that uh, few of the big players they want to buy insurance in, uh, in globally. Uh, through insurance, they can buy real estate. So there's a lot of uh, the uh, reason why insurance is becoming extremely appealing to Chinese. Uh, and I conclude with the last subject, which is quite a popular subject. We are buying a lot of uh, football teams, a lot of sport. Uh, it's not a, a secret. I'm representing a buyer on um, a deal in Italy, the AC Milan deal. We are representing the, the Thai uh, tycoon, Mr. B, who is trying to buy AC Milan. Uh, I'm saying something again very, very public on, on, on the press, uh, not confidential. A uh, few Chinese are quite keen to come into the deal. Uh, it's bad news for me because I'm an Inter Milan uh, supporter, not AC Milan. You know, but <laughs> as a Milan supporter, I hope you will do a <laughs> great fine. job. So, so that, that's good. Let's uh, see. But, but, but the bottom line is strong appetite on sport. You saw in the last few months, a right. uh, few of the big companies, China Media Corporation, they bought Manchester City together with the City Capital, our fund. Right. Uh, they are uh, Wanda, they're buying a sport management company. There are other Chinese buying uh, um, the football team, uh, basketball team. So definitely the trend is huge. The president of China is quite a football fanatic. And, and, and the, the, the big push is uh, let's go and make uh, China a, one of the biggest uh, sports center worldwide. I think they're going to succeed. Uh, we are on few targets right now, not only in Italy, and I think it could be good news for, for the sport worldwide.
Thank you, Federico. And uh, James, probably uh, you need a crystal ball, but uh, how do you see the future for the deal flow again across the Silk Road? Okay. Well, um, as people become more experienced, then the deals will become a normality rather than an exception. We started you know, two years ago as an exception, as an exploration, and now becomes more of a customary, and eventually it will become something like what you know, Europe does with the US, quite common, goes uh, both ways. So this is one uh, thing that's inevitable. But the next thing uh, I also want to remark is that you know, China's real estate is shooting through the roof. I mean, Shanghai, Beijing, and Shenzhen, um, you see, uh, we, we are following the Japanese. You know, Shenzhen's real estate in three months time went up by 70%. And I think it's going to go down by 70% very soon also. So you see what happened in Tokyo likely is going to happen to us. Shanghai this year went up by about 18%. And we're talking about three months, 18%. So uh, capital markets, uh, summer last year was uh, Shanghai Stock Exchange was about 5,000 points and now we're two thirds down. So in other words, uh, at the moment you see a lot of capital from China and uh, we anticipate sooner or later there will be a major correction and also uh, <coughs> there will be lessons to be learned. If you think about the 1980s, Japanese bought Rockefeller Center for a big price and of course later they sold it back at last of the half, half of the price back to the original seller. So you will anticipate a lot of uh, um, uh, failures of Chinese acquisitions anywhere in the world um, already, I think. Um, and uh, this is uh, actually not necessarily a Chinese thing, but anyone who wants to buy business and assets outside uh, anywhere else, then there will be a failure rate. But when the bad news consistently comes back, people also will come back and uh, into their cocoons, they'll be scared. So. Things uh, will, you know, one is become a normality, they will flow around, and second is that uh, um, there will be issues and then things will slow down at some point and we anticipate at some point then the wind uh, will change and then there will be more capital flow into China again. Uh, so next uh, few years from now, and then uh, I mean the next cycle things will turn again. So, um, I, uh, so I, I see, you know, this is more of a normal two-way uh, flow. But Thank Chinese you. are exporting capacity now. No? Yeah. They, have, they have to export capacity. Because uh, <laughs> maybe exporting capacity and also shutting down capacity at some point. Because people, I mean, I want to just uh, uh, you know, remark on the, the general sense of the financial investment community in China is that they have only seen ups. Everybody in China who does investment only knows one thing, invest and then go up and IPO or make money and returns. Correct. And nobody really has gone through the cycle of what about shorting? Because there are a lot of people uh, made a good money out of shorting. Lehman went bankrupt, but there were people who made a lot of money through shorting. So the generation of investors, all those who sit on assets, have not yet learned what is a downward market, but it will happen. And if you are prepared and hedged, then uh, it's not only, you know, you can make profit from this also. So Chinese are exporting asset, but also, uh, sorry, capacity, but some capacity needs to be shut down. Thank you, James. A very last question related to what you didn't mention, so pricing and multiple. Eugenio, how do you see the story? Related? Yeah, the good news is that Chinese companies, they do not buy cheap. Great. They are in a position to pay full strategic prices, not only based on EBITDA multiple or cash flow, or discounted cash flow, but they have, they seem to have a long-term view of the acquired asset and its potential uh, across the cycle. This is very important. They normally buy cyclical companies, uh, capital intensive. In my opinion, they are quite good in uh, giving an appropriate valuation uh, uh, to this kind of, uh, of asset. Uh, and also, when it comes to the bottoms of the cycle, in my personal experience, they were able to refinance a company to perform capital injections. Uh, again, when it comes to trophy assets, uh, they are uh, probably not competitive enough. Uh, but, but when it comes to turnaround projects, mature industry, they seem to have a much, more, a much deeper view of the, of the asset and uh, a long-term uh, strategy. For the future, I see an increasing role of Chinese investors into the Italian market with additional industries like healthcare, as we are saying, leisure, and also real estate. Uh, I'm talking about also residential real estate, not only commercial real estate. With regard to Italian investments into China, this is a question mark. 
I think over the next two, three years, the situation, as for, unfortunately, is not going to change. But probably, if we will able to uh, really to meet the challenge that also the ambassador was mentioning, uh, over the next uh, five, ten years, uh, will uh, this volume of investments will increase again.